Hi, welcome to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. In today's show, we're going to talk about a subject that all of us deal with at some point in our lives, and that is pain. Different types of pain, acute pain and chronic pain, can be dealt with differently. Our guest today is Dr. Bimal Patel. Dr. Patel is a board-certified anesthesiologist and pain management physician. He's done fellowships at the Cleveland Clinic and um, has a practice here in New Jersey, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about chronic pain and different things that can be done to help uh, address your pain problems. Dr. Patel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Dr. Bertone. So tell us about your background and how you got involved in pain. So I'm originally from Queens and New York, and I did my medical school in Long Island. I went out to the Cleveland Clinic for my residency in anesthesiology, did my fellowship in acute pain and then chronic pain, and then I joined uh, Premier Pain Centers in New Jersey just last July. We have offices in Freehold, Shrewsbury, and Brick, and we have a total of five physicians, three physician assistants. And um, I've always had an interest in pain management while in medical school and, and residency. I, I was able to shadow some pain management positions. I really enjoyed the patient interaction aspect. I enjoyed helping patients and seeing the outcomes that they had after my intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, overall, the, the practice, uh, every day we see different patients. Sometimes we'll see patients with migraines. Another day we'll see patients with neck and lower back pain, joint pain. So it's a very diverse patient population, which, which is uh, enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the issue of opioid and opioid addiction has been in the news um, a lot recently, and there's been law changes and prescription changes and stuff, and we're going to talk about opioids right. um, as we get going in the show, but tell us um, about the typical patient that comes into pain management, and, and you know, what, what are they usually there for, and what is a common workup that you would do to assess their pain? Right, so chronic pain is any pain that's prolonged more than three months. So we'll see patients with neck arthritis or lower back arthritis. They might have a disc herniation causing a nerve compression. And the number one component of evaluating this patient is a history and physical examination. Majority of my diagnosis is based on these two components. I might use imaging such as MRI or CAT scan or x-rays to help further hone down my diagnosis and make the treatment plan. Mm -hmm. um, but I practice a multimodal approach um, when examining these patients. Um, I would prescribe these patients physical therapy, medications, sometimes they require injections. Sometimes these patients have severe disease that they need surgery. So I think I'm the person that evaluates this patient and guides them in that correct direction. Hey, you talked about the clinical evaluation, which is so critical, and the history. A lot of times, the patients will come in and they um, you know, immediately want some uh, radiographs or MRIs or, you know, don't we need this, doc? Why, why can't we get testing? And is that always necessary? No, most of the times, the pain condition will, will get better with conservative therapy, physical therapy. Sometimes they require medications to just uh, help with them with the, mm -hmm. with the short-term pain, and then it'll get better. Pain that's persistent, you want to get imaging to find out why it's persistent to see if there's an anatomical defect, some disc that's pressing on a nerve that we want to get corrected. Uh, so most times, it's a, it's a, the body is great at healing itself, and they don't require this further imaging or, or more advanced treatment. Great. Let, let's back up a second and talk about what, what it actually is pain. Why, why does somebody feel discomfort in different areas? Right, so pain is a, is a subjective ma um, uh, matter. Uh, it's, uh, you don't have any like blood pressure or vital signs to figure out if the patient's having pain. It's a perception that the, bra that, that the brain will develop based on, let's say you put your hand on a hot stove, it tells you to take your hand away. So each patient or person will, will interpret this, this sensation differently. Some patients might uh, have severe pain, some people might have less pain, and it's important to tailor their, their treatment plan based on um, how they perceive the pain. Yeah, so I think that's really important because in, in when I see patients every day in pain, a lot of times they'll think, well, they'll see the MRI and they think this is the source of their pain, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes right. it's, it's the way their brain is perceiving this stimulation somewhere, this noxious uh, stimuli, and they're hanging their hat on this test. Right instead of worrying about how do, we, how do we address the pain problem. And I have patients with severe scoliosis, which means the spine is crooked, they have many disc herniations, and they have zero pain. Yeah. And I have patients with one disc herniation, and they have severe pain. So we treat the patient based on how they're presenting, not the imaging or all these lab tests that we have, but mm -hmm. patient, we, treat, we treat them based on their symptoms. Great. 
So you, you talked about some of the, the treatment plans, and one of them is medication. Right. What is what is some of the common medications that you would use? So there's different classes of medications. The first class that I can go over is neuropathic pain medications. Commonly, you might hear about gabapentin or Lyrica, and they modulate peripheral nerve pain to the brain. So they'll quiet the signal of pain down so that the body can tolerate the, the, the pain. There's other neuropathic pain medications that are antidepressants like Cymbalta or amitriptyline that you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. And these also work with other chemicals that transmit pain to the brain. Other classes of medications might include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like Motrin and Advil. And we have prescription strength like meloxicam or diclofenac. And the pain physician will determine which medication is appropriate for the patient based on their comorbidities, based on other medications that they're taking to make mm -hmm. sure there's no interaction or side effects. Um, and then we also have pain patches which are applied to localized areas of pain. So if a patient has a muscle spasm, we have a pain patch where they can put over the area to get pain relief. And what about the, the big one, the, the opioids? Tell us about those. So opioids, for a long time, patients were receiving these medications to treat chronic pain. Um, as you know, we have an opioid crisis in this country. Um, the CDC guidelines are changing, um, and we try to avoid these medications and use other non-opioid adjuncts to treat chronic pain just because there's a high risk of addiction, tolerance, and fatality. People can overdose with these medications. So uh, I think for chronic pain, we try to use other non-opioid medications as well as interventions um, that we offer to, to limit the use of opioids. So is there certain indications where the opioids are absolutely required? Is it more the acute pain or is it? Right, so personally, every physician is different, but personally I use uh, opioids for the acute po post-operative pain period where I know that these patients are not gonna be on it for a long time. Also for cancer pain patients, uh, okay. for these patients they have severe pain and uh, they might not respond to non-opioid adjuncts like NSAIDs or Tylenol, and for these patients, I'm not too concerned about addiction and, and tolerance, um, and I want them to be comfortable um, while they deal with this severe cancer pain. Good, good. All right, so then um, some of the other things you would do are some injections, bo both uh, joint injections, say in, a, in the knee area, or trigger points. Can you explain that process? So trigger point injections are injections that we might perform with a steroid or steroid and anesthetic, and we target a muscle group which is painful for the patient. They may have injured this muscle group either by lifting something the wrong way or they strain their muscle and we'll inject the muscle group to cause inflammation and relax that muscle and give the patient pain relief. There's lots of nerves around this muscle group that causes referred pain and we try to quiet it down with the trigger point injection. It's a simple procedure done in the outpatient office. Um, and then the joint injections that you talked about, we perform it for arthritis, for people with uh, tendinosis um, of the shoulder, the hip, for the knee. Um, and that's typically done with steroids and local anesthetic as well. Now the joint injections, we also have other medications such as visco supplementation, which is a gel injection. And uh, this is useful for patients who don't do well with steroid injections or they're diabetic and, and steroids are not uh, the great option. Um, and, and lastly, we have uh, something called PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. And we take some blood from their vein and spin it down and inject that into the joint to let the body heal uh, the, the d uh, diseased joint. Okay, so you have a lot of options with the injections. The uh, trigger point ones, is that use, um, is that more um, an anesthetic, like a lidocaine? Yes, I think it varies from physician to physician. And personally, I use just local anesthetic. Okay. Um, there's been studies showing dry needling versus local anesthetic, and they've been showing similar outcomes. Um, but the local anesthetic gives the patient some comfort in the immediate po um, post-procedure. Yeah, period. and I, I've been trained in the use of dry needling, and sometimes we'll do that on these trigger points to kind of just break up this taut right. band, right. Uh, which really is the trigger point, right. right? It's a band in the muscle. And the other injections you'll do for tendonitis and such, those are more steroids? Right, exactly. Steroids and then the PRP is the other option, but typically it's a steroid with a local anesthetic. Okay. And the, visco, the visco supplementation is that more for the arthritic joints? Right, yeah. So people with, uh, it's meant for the knee joints mostly. Okay. Um, it's for arthritis, jo arth arthritic joint or patients who have like a meniscal injury. They're not uh, a good candidate for surgery or they don't want to get surgery. We'll use that for that as well. 
Now, I've seen patients get those, and it seems like the ones that are a little bit younger, not so advanced disease, do well, and then right. the older ones, advanced, right. not so well. Is that common? That's common, yeah. yeah. When you have a patient with severe arthritis where it's bone on bone, it's difficult for that gel to do much for the patient, especially when you have gravity working against you. Your body is putting a lot of pressure on these joints. Sometimes these patients require knee, re knee replacement. Okay. Let's go to the next area, which is very common for the uh, neck pain that refers into the arms or the back pain that refers into the legs is the epidural. Right. Can you explain what that is and when you use that? So this is the most, one of the most common procedures that we perform. And uh, epidural steroid injection involves taking a small amount of steroid and injecting it around a nerve root, which is getting compressed. So most times the nerve root will get compressed by a disc herniation. Either maybe someone get, gets involved in an accident or a trauma. Um, sometimes patients have arthritis that causes nerve root compression. And then, then it, it'll cause something, what, what most people know as sciatica. They'll get pain into the leg. Sometimes they'll get pain into the arm. And the steroid medication decreases the inflammation around the nerve and provides pain relief. Most people will get months of relief with this injection. Sometimes they won't even need uh, future injections. Um, it, with the, the first one will give them significant relief. Yeah, this is something you and I see on a daily basis. Right. I mean, the, the arm pain... Uh, or the leg pain, and, and, and people, yeah, do call it sciatica. We know that um, true sciatica is just along the sciatic nerve, which is down the back of the leg. Right. The, other, the other things are called radiculopathy, but um, yeah, when we struggle in physical therapy to try to get that relief, we, we work together and get the inflammation down around the nerve, right. and it and works really well. And I'll tell patients that uh, the injection by itself um, is not the only treatment. They have to go to physical therapy afterwards. I think the mo optimal period to go and, and exercise and do physical therapy is the, the post-procedure time when they have pain, pain relief. Yeah. They, can, they can do more range of motion testing, they can do more strengthening, and, and that's the best time to go back to, for physical therapy. Yeah, and we do these procedures called nerve glides, which we kind of retrain the nerve gliding in the canal of the spine, because otherwise there's some scar tissue there that right. develops from the inflammation, right? And, and patients don't really understand, well, I got the inflammation now, why do I have to do anything? Well, we get them to kind of move this nerve, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, I feel it now, and we help prevent that from becoming a chronic problem. Right. So I think that's really important. Um, let's talk about uh, nerve blocks. What, what are those? So nerve blocks are anytime we inject a, a nerve or a, a bundle of nerves um, which is causing pain. Some examples include intercostal nerve block, which is the nerve that runs underneath the rib. Sometimes people who have fractures of the rib can get pain from this nerve. Uh, people with shingles, they might have something called intercostal neuralgia, which is nerve pain. And we'll inject a local anesthetic and a steroid medication to quiet the pain down. Typically, we'll use ultrasound guidance or fluoroscopy x-ray guidance to, to guide the injection. And people will get good relief with these injections. Another nerve block is a genicular nerve block, which is the nerves around the knees. So people who've had severe osteoarthritis, uh, arthritis of the knee, or if they had knee replacement and they had persistent pain, we can block the pain nerves mm -hmm. around the knee and give them significant relief. That's great. The, uh, I want to go back to the one that you do for the rib. So you, you do that under ultrasound, obviously, right. so you protect the lungs and everything. Exactly. Um, and um, does that give somebody kind of a immediate relief, or does that take a little bit of time? To so the medications that we use are the local anesthetic and steroid. Local anesthetic will most likely give them instantaneous relief, and the steroid medication is what gives them long-term relief. Okay, great. All right, so when we come back, we're going to talk about some more advanced procedures that are being done to help people um, with chronic pain. Fast-paced family life in need of a slowdown? Hello, I'm Dr. Spruce. Did you know all those green shapes on maps are parks and forests? It's true. Visit discovertheforest.org and plan to visit a park or forest near you, instead of just wondering what it would have been like. While the word forest might make you think of distant lands from far, far away, please note parks and forests are closer than you think, which means things like beautiful scenery, fresh air, and family time are also closer than you think. They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth.
made her college years possible, opening that education savings account when she was little, spearheading campus tours, and deciphering financial aid. If you can ace planning for college, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. Welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today's guest is Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel works at Premier Pain Management with offices throughout New Jersey. And we're talking about pain and different aspects on, on treatment options and how to help patients with chronic pain. Dr. Patel, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Dean. So we, we finished the first half talking about nerve blocks. You wanted to uh, mention a few other procedures regarding nerve blocks. What are those? Right, another nerve block that I typically do with ultrasound guidance is an ilioinguinal nerve block. The ilioinguinal nerve, it uh, causes pain around the groin area. Typically, I'll see it with patients with, uh, after inguinal hernia surgery. Mm. They get this burning, they get this tingling pain around the groin area, and this is, it causes a lot of uh, limitations in their activities. They can't walk properly. And the, the block will give them instantaneous relief, uh, and the steroid medication will give them longer term relief. It was, we'll, rep we'll repeat the block if, as necessary if their pain comes back in the future. A similar block is uh, something called the TAP block, which is called the transversus abdominis plane block. It's pretty much for patients who've had abdominal surgery, and they've had scar tissue buildup, and they've had persistent abdominal wall pain. Mm -hmm. And the TAP block, also done with ultrasound, is done with steroid and local anesthetic and quiets the nerves that are in that abdominal wall. People get significant relief with this injection as well. Fabulous. Um, so another procedure that you guys do is radiofrequency ablation, and I guess that's for some of the spinal nerves. Right. So the radiofrequency ablation involves heating the pain nerves that are causing pain for the patient. We can do it in the neck area, in the lower back. We'll do it for the knee involves doing a diagnostic block first. We'll block the nerves that we're suspecting is causing the patient's pain with a local anesthetic. And if the patient has significant relief, more than 50, 60, 70% relief, even for a short term, we know that this is the nerve that's causing the patient's pain. And we'll go there and heat these nerves up. Now we do testing while we do this type of procedure to make sure we're burning only the pain nerves and not the motor nerves. So we're solely just taking the care of the patient's pain and not affecting their function. Okay. Patients will have a long-term relief with this and unfortunately these pain nerves will grow back in the future. Sometimes they grow back fast or slow and we can always repeat the procedure to give them uh, relief again. So can you explain when you do this burning, so that you're talking about the same nerve and the, and the pain fibers are kind of on the outside, right? Okay. And then the motor fibers are deeper. Exactly. So you have to be careful on how, you, how you burn that. So when we're doing the testing, we're making sure that we don't get the motor nerve fibers, which, which was, um, and just the pain fibers. Okay. And when you, do the, when you do the testing with the lidocaine to see if you have the right area, is that done at the same time? Is the patient awake or you do that another time? A different time, yeah. Okay. We'll have them come in before the scheduling from, from them for the radio frequency ablation and if they have relief with that we'll send them home with a pain diary they can put their pain scores down over the next few hours the next few days and then we'll review that with them when they come back great um, so some of the other more advanced things are uh, spinal cord stimulators so now you're talking about more permanent uh, things that are put into the body. Can you explain that process? So spinal cord stimulators are, it's part of a, a, a term like neuromodulation where okay. we're trying to modulate the pain from your peripheral to your brain. And it involves placing electrodes in the epidural space in the spinal cord area to block the pain from either your legs or your arms. Um, if you have neck and upper extremity pain, we'll put the spinal cord stimulator leads in the cervical region. If you have lower back pain and leg pain, we'll put it in the thoracic region. And with studies, it's, we've shown that the pain is modulated in this area and uh, we'll set the patient up for a trial period. Typically, we'll have the trial period for a week and the patient will let us know, hey, did they get significant relief with this? If they're getting 50%, 70%, 80% relief, we take the leads out and then we schedule them for an implant where they get the battery permanently implanted. Okay. 
And when you say uh, modulation, is it something that they feel or they don't sense anything at so all? So there's two types of uh, spinal cord stimulator. There's um, a, a paresthesia based where the patient will feel a sensation in that, in that, that extremity or, or um, area of, of pain. And then there's non-paresthesia based, um, which is like a higher frequency, which they don't feel any of, the, any of that frequency okay. um, uh, or paresthesia um, type of So is that symptoms. similar to like when somebody puts, say, a TENS unit on the outside, they'll feel similar, that right. tingling? Exactly. Right, it works on a gate theory of pain. Exactly. You're kind of blocking the pain by giving it a distraction. Right. So how does it work when they don't feel anything? So this is a very high frequency. So this is uh, above the threshold where the pain fibers are, are causing the paresthesia. So it's a much higher frequency than the pain fibers will fire at, and that patient won't feel it. So it's just modulating the pain in that manner. But the other one, people are feeling this kind of tingling the right, whole time. Right. And do they get accustomed to that and they have to change it? Or well, Some patients will adjust it. They have reprogramming. Um, some patients, they don't tolerate it, and they end up switching over to a different device, which is a non-paresthesia based um, and it's all based on patient preference on what the, what they tolerate. Now that's something you wouldn't do first, obviously. It's something when people right. have failed other. Exactly. Typically, I'll try the conservative measures, but medications, they've had injections or physical therapy. They still have had persistent pain. Um, it's also useful for patients who are on high dose opioids who are wanting to come down on these opioids. Uh, they're addicted to these medications, not helping them much, and they want to try a different modality of pain management, and we offer this for them. So you mentioned the opioids and the addiction problem that's going on. Um, obviously, you're limiting what you're giving out. Do you, do you deal with any patients that have had the addiction and work with them on controlling their pain as they're coming off their medications? Right. I, I will help um, uh, them help come off these opioids by using non-opioid adjuncts. Yeah, some of these patients have never tried the neuropathic pain agents. They haven't tried stronger anti-inflammatories. Um, so I will add these medications while they're coming off the opioids, and then I might introduce neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation to help them with this. Um, uh, patients that are on long chronic uh, opioids, they develop something called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, where being on these medications uh, causes more pain. Mm. And I've seen them p come, in, come into the office and their pain is 10 out of 10, and coming off of them, I wean them off completely and their pain has improved just by simply weaning them off these opioids because mm. that opioid-induced hyperalgesia component gets better. So the weaning process, is that is that something similar to, say, alcohol addiction? Is it gradual? Is it a step program? How, does, how do things Right. Work? It all depends on, on how long they're on these medications for and, and how they tolerate the, the side effects of the weaning process. We have medications that help them with the side effects of, of the weaning. Uh, I mean, I have medications such as clonidine, we have uh, tizanidine, which is a muscle relaxant. Um, gabapentin sometimes helps with the, with, the, with the weaning process. If they have diarrhea, we have loperamide, which helps with that. With that. Um, so we'll slowly titrate them off, uh, maybe over weeks or months, depending on how they tolerate the weaning process. I know the education with the opioid addiction has become very big, so the public is learning about it more, and there's laws that prevent, really, the ordering of, right, right? it restricts how you right. can order them, right? right. Um, what are some of the what are some of the future advances you think in pain management? Things that you're seeing studies with, or um, that might help with the the eliminating the need for opioids right. or some other procedures. What's the going nice on? The nice thing about our practice at Premier Pain, uh, we are involved in many clinical research studies, and we are uh, involved with many uh, uh, companies and research groups to test out uh, different products, such as uh, intraspinous spacer is one of the products that we have for spinal stenosis. Patients with severe spinal stenosis, we place a spacer between their spinous process to open up the space and, and relieve their symptoms. Um, we also have other minimally invasive procedures to remove some of the stenosis and, and help these patients. We also have new medications that are coming out that we're clinically uh, doing research trials for to see if a longer acting steroid medication can give patients longer term relief or a clonidine pellet might give this patient longer relief. So a lot of research is being performed to see what other modalities will help these patients for the long run. Do you see any future where um, 
there'll be more things directly to affect a nerve, say. I know nerves are something you can't really remove in the body, correct? So mm -hmm. I, I think the only place is maybe dentistry where when you get a root canal, right. it's like immediate, right? But I'm not right. sure you can do that anywhere else. So similar to spinal cord stimulation, we have something called peripheral nerve stimulation. Wow. And there are a few companies that are coming out with small, tiny hair type um, leads that we can place around a peripheral nerve to modulate the signal. So if patients have had median nerve, like carpal tunnel pain, and we can place a small lead around there, or, or scapular pain around their shoulders, we can modulate specific areas with peripheral nerve stimulation. And we're doing studies on this as well. Um, patients with uh, amputation pain, mm -hmm. they've had pain from the femoral or the sciatic nerve, and we can place the, the leads around these specific nerves to modulate pain. So a lot to look forward to um, in, in, the, cool. in the field of neuromodulation. So that's something that's implanted in yes. them? Yes, we'll wow. and we'll do the same way. We'll do a trial period, and if they have significant relief, more than 50%, we'll set them up for an implant. Okay, and what about some um, remedies for acute things? Say, um, you know, the acute muscle spasm, somebody's in a whiplash, right. and they, they come to you, and obviously you rule out any kind of fractures or anything, but they have a lot of muscle spasm and guarding and having difficulty moving. What's available for the acute pain? Right, so I will use uh, all the medications, so the muscle relaxants, I will use non steroidal anti inflammatory medications. Heat and cold therapy is useful for them, and physical therapy is the mainstay for these types of acute injuries. Um, sometimes patients with whiplash injury, they might have edema in their s small joints of the neck or lower back, and we call this like facet um, arthropathy. Mm -hmm. And we can inject these joints if they're inflamed with some steroid medication to quiet their pain down. Um, and then we have the pain patches that also help with their acute pain. So yeah, you get that pretty early on, exactly. right? And then you encourage the movement, and that's where the physical therapy exactly. comes in. So we start retraining these right. people. Um, how about some atypical conditions, things that you might see rarely? What are, what are some of those uh, types of things? Sometimes, you know, I will see patients with um, migraines. You know, we, okay. we, this is one condition that we, it's a, it's a long evaluation for these, t these types of conditions. We have to determine what the cause of the migraines are. There's different types of migraines like tension headaches or cluster headaches, and each patient has specific symptoms that will categorize them for this type of headache and treat appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, most times it's medications that we're controlling that have a preventive medication. We have medications that are abortive where the patient might have a migraine on Monday and they just take one pill. If it's a daily basis, then we have a preventive medication that helps them with these migraines. Um, we also have something called vagal nerve stimulators for migraines. Um, this is a relatively new technology where we stimulate the vagus, vagus nerve to help patients with, with chronic migraines. Also, we also do Botox injections um, for patients with chronic migraines, and these, these patients will have about three, four months of relief with Botox injections. Yeah, I've seen that. I have um, a patient recently, because we get a lot of headache in physical therapy, this, this cervicogenic type, right. which are kind of emanating from the neck. Yep. And um, her, her physician's been using the Botox, and it's mm -hmm. an interesting combination, but it's, it's worked really well with, uh, yeah. with these types of patients. Yeah, headache is a, is a difficult thing to, to work with, right? right? A lot, a lot of, lot of workup involved, making sure we're ruling out any uh, uh, red flags like cancer, all the other things, and then treating the migraines based with medications. Sometimes injections will help as well. And you, you mentioned cancer, so the, in these patients, obviously, there's some advanced cancers where the pain is, is really uh, tremendous. Right. And so do you, do you see those people in outpatient, or is that something that more seen in the hospital setting? We will see them once in a while in the outpatient setting. Most times they're going to the hospital, but uh, we do see them once in a while. I've had patients with breast cancer, um, and these patients are doing well with some, some medications. Sometimes they might require some injections. They've had mastectomy, they've had persistent pain around that area, and we offer them injections and some neuropathic medications to help with that. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. It thank was you a pleasure having you. Yep, thanks so much. You've been listening about uh, pain with uh, Dr. Bimar Patel from Premier Pain. And um, until next time, I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. You've been watching You and Your Health.